Hi everyone, um, I'm just about to leave early, early, early tomorrow morning to head out to AirPlay in Florida. And uh, on top of that, uh, this video is not going to be an update on the Gregory Allen Elliott Twitter harassment trial. Um, it uh, essentially they had an, uh, an, a new snag and I really want to get a handle on that and be able to integrate that into my coverage. And so uh, that will be coming at you early next week. There's plenty of time to get all the information out. Um, they're the date uh, where they have to deal with this snag is September 4th and that may delay the judge's ruling um, that was scheduled to come down on October 6th so there's lots of time to get all the information out there and I want to make sure that when I do put the information out there it is correct and complete. So uh, today I decided uh, to give you guys a bit of a send-off um, in terms of uh, a, I received an email from uh, someone who is LDS, and if uh, any of you don't know what that is, it is uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as Mormon. And uh, he, um, I don't, I don't get a lot of correspondence from um, Mormons. Uh, I, I drink, I smoke, I'm an atheist. I swear, I'm, you know, rude and in your face and. And, uh, but I, I te do tend to get along with them when I meet them, and, and I think that they're generally nice uh, people and, and just, just regular people. So, uh, anyway, he was telling me that uh, he had tried to explain all of this, the men's rights position, um, the things that I talk about, to a friend of his who happened to also be LDS. And I wanted to uh, respond to his letter because it is so rare to get a letter from someone who's LDS. And decided that I was going to do it in video form because of the length of it. It, it just, like, the length of uh, what I essentially have to say um, is, is just... Uh, if I'm going to write that length of an email, I might as well put it into a video. That's all I'm saying. So anyhow, here goes. Um, here's what his friend said to him, and uh, I will, maybe I'll do a color change or a m sound modification or something in between what his friend said in response to the MRE position and, and my response to that. So here goes. So his friend said, well, nearly every aspect of our society has for centuries been organized by and for men. And my response to that is, that's a huge assumption, and one, I presume, derives from the idea that people organize things primarily for their own individual benefit. So let's take things a little smaller. Let's take it to the smallest unit of society, the family. Households are typically organized by the adults, but who are they organized for? I would suggest it stretches the bounds of credulity to believe that families are organized by adults solely for the benefit of adults uh, and ignoring the needs and, and the, the desires and the well-being of children. In fact, a typical household with children will largely revolve around those needs and the nurturance of the well-being of those children. Now, in those households, children have no more formal power than your friend seems to believe women had in society. Uh, children don't get a say in how things are run, and yet the typical family, in that family, things run primarily toward the furtherance of children's interests as well as the interests of the adults. So even if our society has for centuries been organized by men, and even that's an assumption I would take issue with, there's no reason to assume that a society organized by men would function solely or even primarily in the interests of men. Men have wives. Men have daughters. Men have mothers. Men have all of these people that they care about that happen to have vaginas. And they want those people to do well. They want those people to be happy and healthy. They want those people to succeed and have decent lives. Um, at least that's what normal men do, and that's what normal men have always done. So, I, it just doesn't follow. Now, given your friend's status as an LDS, I find it 
strange that he would think society's been organized by and for men rather than society having been organized by God for everyone. Now, this gentleman uh, it was essentially a bombardment. It was like a large paragraph of points that I'm taking one by one. This gentleman went on to say, there's a reason Jesus's relationships with women and his commands to take care of the widows were somewhat revolutionary. People just didn't do that sort of thing. And I'm here to tell you that in the 70s, feminists came out with the revolutionary idea that beating your wife is wrong. Oops, except for the fact that in 1906, Theodore Roosevelt proposed bringing back corporal punishment specifically for men who beat their wives, employing the revolutionary idea that beating your wife is wrong. Oops, except for the fact that in the, by the mid-1800s, wife battering was illegal in nearly every U.S. state, and even in states where it wasn't, simple assault and battery laws covered domestic violence because the idea that beating your wife is wrong was just that revolutionary. Oops, except for the fact that Blackstone came out with that revolutionary idea in the mid-1700s in his commentaries on the laws of England and Wales, claiming that men of previous eras beat their wives with legal and moral impunity, but men of his era were more enlightened and have ensured women have a revolutionary security of the peace against abusive husbands, and so on and so on. Every single time this revolutionary idea is brought up, Previous generations are vilified as not caring about protecting women from violence, but us people here, we're different. Except we aren't. Fundamentalist Christians in the U.S. vilify Islamists by claiming they mistreat and abuse their women. And militant Islamic imams vilify Americans and radicalize their young men by claiming Westerners mistreat and abuse their women. Oh my goodness, it's like both sides can justify attacking the other based on the fact that they mistreat and abuse their women. I mean, I'm kind of de detecting a pattern here. So when you say people just didn't do that sort of thing, when that sort of thing was taking care of women in their society, and, you know, and when you say that this was a, a revolutionary idea, well, maybe it was, but given how same old, same old, a lot of these revolutionary ideas about protecting and taking care of women turn out to be when people actually look into them and the history, I'm going to want conclusive proof of the revolutionary nature of Jesus' edict before believing it was in any way revolutionary for the time. Now you can go ahead and call me cynical, but fool me once, shame on you. Fool me hundreds of thousands of times over hundreds of thousands of years. You get my drift. He continues, More recent examples would include coverture, the legal doctrine that women ceased to exist when they got married, revoked in the late 1800s. I would say that's a very strange way to describe it. Women ceased to exist as economically and legally independent individuals, yes. This did not, however, mean they ceased to exist legally or economically. Coverture did indeed put restrictions on women. It was the difference between being femme sole and femme covert. A woman who was femme sole had a right to enter into a legal contract, and she was kind of, sort of, but not always responsible for upholding her side of that contract. When she became femme covert, she lost the right to enter into a legal contract because her husband now became responsible for upholding her side of any contract she entered into. This meant she required his permission because he would be held responsible for the results. A woman who was femme sole had a right to own her own income and a property, and she was kind of, sort of, but not really responsible for her own support and upkeep. When she became femme covert, her property and income fell under the administration of her husband, and he was responsible 100% for her support and upkeep. This responsibility was so entrenched that a man could be charged with a crime, for dressing himself in silk and his wife in sackcloth. She was also endowed with dower rights regarding his real property. That is, if he owned a house and wanted to sell it, he needed her permission, as she had a life interest in the property. Keep in mind, she didn't own the property or hold any financial interest in it. What she had was a right to live in it if she wanted to, and therefore the right to prevent him from selling it out from under her. 
While there were provisions in the law for a man to use mild correction on his wife, this was certainly understandable given the aspects of coverture that held him responsible for his wife's crimes and debts. A man's responsibility for this was so encoded into law and culture that a woman 200 years ago could go to a shop, make a purchase, and instruct the shop owner to bill her husband. If the wife was overspending, the husband would actually have to go to each shop individually and instruct the owner not to sell merchandise to his wife. He was financially responsible for any purchases she might make and any debts she might incur. But, oh my God, she was barred from taking out a loan without a male cosigner. The injustice. And interestingly enough, one of the very few crimes a woman might commit that her husband by law was specifically exempt from being held accountable for was petty treason. Petty treason is the murder of a spouse. So if she murdered him, he couldn't be hanged in her stead. But yeah, the moment she got married, she legally ceased to exist, entirely legally ceased to exist. All of these protections built into the law were built into the law to protect non-persons who don't exist. Hmm. He goes on to mention prohibition from voting. And I would suggest that you ask your friend when he thinks all men got the vote. Prior to universal male suffrage, only property owners had the vote, less than 3% of the population, not all of whom were men. And a recently discovered document from the mid-1800s showed women voting in par parliamentary elections in the UK you know, in the mid-1850s. Some of them were business owners, a hundred years before women were allowed to own businesses and stuff. Now, what is interesting is that in the beginning, universal male suffrage was tied by public debate and legal precedent to men's citizenship responsibilities, including military and civil conscription. Uh, civil conscription would be described by things like hue and cry laws, where uh, a male bystander could be criminally punished for failing to intervene in a situation where someone was raising a hue and cry, where a crime was being committed and they just kept on walking right past it. So let's picture it. Someone is being attacked. They raise a hue and cry and all men within earshot were required by law to aid that person, even at the potential risk of their lives. Under the law at that time, a hundred male bystanders could be held as accountable for the crime as the perpetrator if they didn't intervene. Now, none of that crap applied to women and it still doesn't. Crazy, isn't it? And it's really odd that men were subject to these traditional responsibilities long before they won universal suffrage for themselves. And odd, again, that women, when they won suffrage, became subject to none of these responsibilities. He continues, the legality of marital rape. Now, this is an odd way to put it, too, because it's not that rape within marriage was legal. It's just that it wasn't really recognized as a thing. Um, both men and women had a right to sex within marriage. In fact, in the Middle Ages, one of the few ways a woman could obtain a divorce was by claiming her husband was incapable of performing sexually. And the man would have to prove that he was up for it in front of a panel of elder women from their village in order to not find himself divorced and responsible for alimony for life or until she remarried. Now, can you imagine being in that position, having to get it up in front of a bunch of grizzled old ladies to avoid finding, you know, a finding of fault that meant you're paying for a wife without actually having one, possibly until the day you die? You better jerk it hard, motherfucker. And when marital rape was made illegal, when it was actually made a concept under the law, who was the gender that people had in mind as far as who they wanted to protect? Were people interested in protecting both men and women from the idea that in marriage sex is part of the deal? If so, why was a man ordered by a court of law in 2010 to pay his ex $10,000 for not putting out enough while they were married? 
I find it very interesting that the idea that marital rape was legal only seems to upset people when women are the victims of it, particularly when a massive cross-cultural study of sexual coercion in heterosexual relationships found that rates of marital rape and sexual coercion were roughly gender symmetrical, with women slightly more likely to physically force their male partners and men slightly more likely to verbally coerce their female partners. I mean, really, if the only people we care about protecting from marital rape are women, how can you say women are oppressed by this? Moving on, he says, the fact that until recently women were expected to be fired from jobs the moment they got pregnant. And my response to this would be, you mean people who get paid to work for an employer are expected to perform work for that employer in order to get paid? How very strange. Maternity leave was not a thing when my mom got pregnant with her first child. Somehow she and my dad managed. I'm not saying it isn't nice to have. I've certainly taken an advantage of it. But the reality is that pregnant women cost employers in terms of both productivity and reliability. Those costs, uh, they aren't, uh, you know, swallowed by employers. They don't just like disappear into the ether. They're swallowed by the other workers, which is one reason why diversity requirements often don't apply legally to small companies. There just aren't enough other workers there to subsidize the female employees who fall pregnant. Another group who pays for, you know, women who become pregnant and receive maternity benefits in a lot of countries in the West are the taxpayer. Um, or other people paying unemployment insurance premiums. We all pay the same premiums, but uh, only women really pull those premiums um, when there are children born. Uh, men get a certain amount of paternity leave. There's a certain amount of parental leave that can be shared between them, uh, between the two parents, but women are the ones who are pulling those benefits. And therefore it is men um, on the whole who are subsidizing those women and their choices. He continues that employers treat female employees and potential employees differently from males. And my answer to that is like they do now. And if and when they don't, feminist groups would like a word with them because it's not acceptable to them to treat female employees as shitty as male employees are treated. Do you think men who wanted to take time off during the Industrial Revolution because of a loss in the family or a personal matter or what have you, do, do you think they had an easier time of things? Do you think that they didn't get fired and replaced? How about if a man was injured or fell ill? You think he didn't get fired and replaced? Have you ever wondered where the male attitude of suck it up, walk it off, and play through the pain comes from? Maybe from the reality for millennia that if you didn't do that, if you're lucky, you got fired and replaced, and if you weren't, you were just dead. A while ago, I read a book, a very interesting book, by a social psychologist named Roy Baumeister. It was called, Is There Anything Good About Men? In it, he outlined the differences between the traditionally male spheres and the traditionally female ones. Paid work, war, and politics are traditionally male. And these spheres were, historically, ones where individuals have always been considered expendable and replaceable. Just watch some footage of World War I soldiers swarming out of the trenches and across the dead man's zone and getting mowed down en masse because their lives were worth that two feet of ground. They're spheres where cooperative relationships extend further but are more shallow, more hierarchical, and more easily abandoned than in the traditionally female spheres of immediate family and community. Now, one of the most intriguing side benefits of women entering the workforce during the Industrial Revolution was that governments actually began to impose labor standards on employers. They began for the first time in history to dictate to employers how many hours a day an employee could be made to work if he wanted to keep his job, how many breaks employees should be allowed to take, and there were finally, for the first time ever, workplace safety standards. One of the pivotal events pre precipitating a massive legislated reform in the workplace safety standards was the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire of 1911, which killed 123 women. Now, 
Your friend is not going to try to tell me it was the 23 men killed who spurred those changes. He knows it's not. Those changes helped everyone, including men, but they were brought about because of those 123 women, not the thousands upon thousands of men who died at work since the beginning of recorded human history. Now, maybe when women start applying to work building skyscrapers in Dubai, there will be changes made for the thousands of exploited male workers there too. He continues, and perhaps the biggest one, women have to literally bear the consequences of unprotected sex. Well, we have to bear the biological ones, but uh, both men and women have to bear consequences. Unless you think a $100,000 baby mortgage isn't a consequence. And before the entire child support system became a thing, right, we had um, paternity suits, uh, we had, uh, and, and we actually had women getting money out of the fathers of their children, even if they weren't married. Uh, we had, uh, in, the, in the early 1900s, there were actually women who scammed multiple men. They would say, this is your child, to multiple men and would be collecting money from all of those men. Um, in order to, you know, these men would all be giving her money because they didn't want their wife to find out that they were cheating. Um, you had uh, shotgun weddings. Uh, you had seduction laws, uh, laws that essentially reflect uh, that passage in Deuteronomy where, you know, if a man uh, lies with an unmarried uh, woman of, vir of virtue, um, he needs to make reparation in part by marrying her. Um, essentially, you had uh, an entire system set up so that men were held accountable for the children they created. That's what marriage is. It's a way to hold men accountable for the children they create. Um, and you even find this in India right now. Over 50% of the rape accusations that come across investigators' desks stem from consensual sex between unmarried people, and most of them result in the marriage of the two parties. Most of that 50% result in the marriage of the two parties, because that is why the women lodged the complaints. They had regrets. Uh, they got pregnant. They decided that they, that premarital sex wasn't for them, and they wanted to be married. And so they would lodge a complaint of rape against the man over the consensual sex that they had, and he would be forced to marry her or go to prison, right? That's how things were, right? And I can guarantee you in 15 years, just like feminists do today, the feminists in India are going to be saying, looking at all of those dockets, all of those cases, this rape claim, that rape claim, resolution, the, the victim gets married to her rapist, right? They will say, oh, just 15 years ago, women in India were forced to marry their rapists, when in reality, the rape accusation is brought in order to extort marriage out of the man that they had consensual sex with, right? This is what marriage is. Marriage is leverage for women to coerce men to take care of them and their children. And this is what those laws, right? Those laws essentially saying women should not have sex outside of marriage. Women should be, they should protect their chastity. Women should do this until they get married, right? That's what those were all designed to do, right? To make sure that when a woman had a baby, there was a man to hold accountable for it. He goes on. A lot of the issues MRAs try to bring up are either irrelevant. Example, most feminists would prefer for more women to serve in the armed forces. My response to that is, and if only more women wanted to do it, but they don't. And if only more women were capable of it, but they aren't. And if only feminists would campaign for women to be conscripted, in case of need, the way men are, but they don't, and they won't. Feminists want options in the areas where men have always had obligations. He continues. 
or consequences of opening labor competition to a huge portion of the population that was shut out before women. My response, women were shut out? When exactly? Because I can go all the way back to the, four, to the 1400s, 1432, and I can find women on the roster of the London Blacksmiths Guild, listed as masters of their trade. The brewing and weaving industries were dominated by women for a long time, hence the still common surnames Brewster and Webster, which literally mean female brewer and female weaver. More than this, a hundred years ago, we used to put three-year-old white kids in fields to pick cotton for ten hours a day. Do you really think women were shut out of that kind of labor? The truth is, women weren't shut out. Women had an entitlement to the financial support of their husbands. And before they got married, if they never got married, they had something called children's privilege which meant that they had an entitlement to the financial support of their families. He elaborates, this is a big change, meaning that men have to be more qualified to work than in the past, and since wage work has been, since the 1800s, a huge part of American male identity, that's a blow to some people's self-concept. I suppose so, but the reality is that men's wages in adjusted dollars since the 1970s have been stagnant or on the decline, while women's have been on a fairly steady rise. But all in all, families are no better off than they were. Women's earnings have not increased enough to compensate for the decline in men's and our changing way of life. We have higher standards of living, more square footage per person, nicer cars, etc. But we have way more consumer debt and almost the entire increase in consumer debt is tied up in loans and credit card debt for depreciable assets like cars, TVs, and even groceries, not homes or businesses. One of the biggest changes has been in the proportional growth of single adult households. It's estimated that the trend through divorce and single parenthood away from intact families to single adult households has massively increased consumption of water, oil, coal, hydroelectricity, food, household goods, and services. If people lived the way they did in the 70s, when 85% of adults over 25 lived in intact marriages, billions of gallons of water per year would be saved in the U.S. alone. In terms of adjusted dollars, the cost of homes hasn't substantially increased, but people are increasingly paying for two homes when, 40 years ago, when, you know, they were paying for one. That's two water bills, two sewer lines to maintain, two cable bills, two heating bills, two phone lines, two internet subscriptions, two refrigerators, two washing machines for every two adults where before the 1970s typically there would be one. As well, despite the cost of many necessities remaining level or decreasing over that time, the one necessary expenditure that will land you in jail if you don't pay it, taxes, has increased tremendously and a significant portion of this increase goes toward funding the changes in our family structure. Welfare for single mothers, WIC, daycare subsidi subsidies, Section 8 housing, after-school programs, food stamps, child support extraction agencies, all of that. And the reality of that is that 75% of the tax burden, of the total tax burden, falls on men. While the vast majority of government provided benefits and subsidies are consumed by women. So we literally have men subsidizing women's independence from men. He continues, it's something that should be dealt with, but it shouldn't be considered women's fault. Rolling back the clock by kicking women out of the labor force, as was literally done at the end of World War II, isn't the answer. We need to figure out ways to help people adapt to the new circumstances. I'm not sure whether he gets what MRAs are actually talking about. We aren't really keen on kicking women out of the labor force. We're more about letting the labor force sort itself out. What that means is that when feminists complain constantly that women don't get equal pay for equal work, and we need measures to compensate, and in some cases, companies are actually giving bonuses to women to compensate for a wage gap that doesn't exist the way they believe it does, and some feminists like Jessica Valenti have actually flat out suggested we pay men less than women solely based on gender. 
we will be there to tell them they're full of shit. A woman who gets a bonus for having a vagina means a man isn't getting an equal bonus simply because he has a penis. Paying men less for the same work is fundamentally unfair. It only makes it more unfair when it's based on raw, a raw wage gap that doesn't compare apples to apples, and when apples to apples comparisons rarely find much of a gap at all. When feminists complain about how there aren't more women in STEM fields, MRAs will be there to say, so what? Psychology, veterinary medicine, sociology, and other such fields are heavily dominated by women. Medicine is now more than 50% women. University itself is now 60% women. Where is the outcry over these inequalities? Why is there only an outcry in the one area of study where men still dominate? How much money are you prepared to spend convincing women to take courses of study that they just don't seem interested in? How many qualified male applicants should be rejected in favor of less qualified and less interested female ones? Just so you can hit your magic ratio of 50-50. Why can't you just let men and women be interested in what they're interested in? If a man is more likely to be happy taking engineering, and a given woman is more likely to be happy taking nursing or child psychology, what injustice has been done? When feminists complain that the billions of do government dollars per year that fund women's domestic and sexual violence services isn't enough, MRAs will be there to complain that the zero government dollars that fund such services for the approximately half of all victims who are men and boys, well, they really aren't enough. And that the use of feminist models of interpersonal violence unjustly smear men as a monolithic perpetrator class when women are every bit as likely to be violent and sexually coercive toward their intimate partners, and that it's egregious that these models result in male victims being more likely to be arrested than helped when they call police, more likely to be referred to abuser treatment programs than victim services when they call hotlines, and that boys as young as 12 years old are sent back to abusive fathers when their mothers seek shelter in dom with domestic violence organizations because as a male, that boy is seen as a danger to the other residents at the shelter. When feminists complain about not enough being done to protect women from rape and hold rapists accountable, and when they talk about how our society condones and normalizes male sexual aggression against women, MRAs like me will be there to remind people that across the entirety of the West over the last 40 years we have already eroded due process protections and altered procedural, investigative, and evidentiary standards all in favor of complainants and with the goal of convicting more rapists such that a sexual assault trial looks nothing like a trial for any other type of violent felony. We will be there to remind them that rape was the last non-lethal crime that qualified for the death penalty in nearly all countries that employed the death penalty. We will be there to remind them that over 50% of all the exonerations secured by the Innocence Project are men who were convicted of sex crimes, which means that sex crimes have a higher wrongful conviction rate than all other crimes combined. One of the last people sentenced to hang in my country was a 14-year-old boy convicted of the rape and murder of a female classmate. 14 years old. Lucky bastard, because of his age, the government of Canada commuted his sentence to life in prison, which he served the mandatory minimum. He was finally officially exonerated in 2007 at the age of 62. Six of the ten most famous exonerations in Canada involve violent crimes against women. Clearly, clearly society endorses and normalizes rape and violence against women so much and is so eager to let male offenders off the hook that any given man is more likely to be wrongly convicted of rape or a violent crime against a woman than he is of any other type of crime. And yet the feminist juggernaut just chugs along. It just rolls right on, demanding even more legislation and policy changes to make it even easier to convict men, rightly or wrongfully, of sex crimes against women. That 14-year-old boy sentenced to hang 
even before all of these legal reforms were introduced? Well, he's just collateral damage, isn't he? And where, oh where, have you heard any of us say that these things are women's fault? MRAs spread the blame very, very fairly. We blame both men and women. We blame both feminism and traditionalism. He says, and to summarize, yes, there are problems particular to men. However, they are typically different both in kind and degree from women's problems. My reply is, yes, they are. The most substantial difference is that it's much more difficult to convince people to care about men's problems, even when those problems drive them to suicide. Well, it's very easy to convince people that a man sitting comfortably on the subway should be fined for upsetting a small cadre of very loud, very demanding women who claim his way of sitting is a sign of male patriarchal dominance over female space. He continues, and women aren't to blame for them, at least if you think letting women succeed in the workplace and have legal rights are good things. I would respond, name me one right men have under the law that women don't. Just one. Just one. I can name you three rights women have that men don't across most of the West, and a fourth that women have in, in the U.S. that men don't. And again, no one's specifically blaming women here. But here's the most interesting thing. Why would a group complaining about the unequal treatment of men be automatically perceived as blaming women? Perhaps it's because we've been trained to think that way. Could it be, just maybe, that so much of the feminist litany of complaints about the treatment of women boiled down at their essence to it's all men's fault. Because that's what it's been right from the get-go, right from that bullet point list of grievances in the Declaration of Sentiments in 1848. Your friend seems to have a very strange impression of the MRM. We don't hate women, and we don't blame women. Most of our favorite spokespeople are women. Myself, Christina Hoff Summers, Kathy Young, Ash Scow, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I've heard it pronounced about eight different ways. Wendy McElroy, Drs. Tara Palmacchia and Helen Smith, Alison Tiemann, Barbara Kay, Robin Urbach, Jasmine Newman, and a multitude of other women who somehow can see through the feminist miasma of stench about manspreading, mansplaining, manslamming, man flu, rape culture, male privilege, and safe spaces for women. And we understand at least a bit of what men have to deal with. Even more important than that, we women, the ones who speak about these issues, we see what boys are going through. We see what boys are seeing, reflected by society about themselves. We see the funhouse mirror, and it's not pretty. We're appalled. We're appalled by the negative messages these boys are getting about their own natural rambunctiousness, about their interests and their feelings, about their place in the world, and about how their society feels about them. It's not. It's not okay. It's really not. Anyhow, that's all I have to say. Um, to this uh, very, very nice uh, Elias man and his male friend uh, who had all of these objections. I hope it clarifies uh, some of how I feel and how I think most people in the MRM feel about these issues. Um, I'm not sure where everybody, well, I am sure where they get the impression that we want to turn back the clock to 1950, that we want to bar women from the workplace and all of these things. Um, they get it from secondhand hearsay from people like David Futrell and, and uh, websites like Jezebel, and, uh, and then it just spreads from there. And uh, it gets to the point where um, you spend almost half your time explaining 
what you didn't say rather than explaining what you want to say. And uh, I hope this clarifies things for this uh, LDS man and his friend. So anyhow, that's all I really have to say uh, in response to all of that. I think that uh, even people in highly traditional uh, situations, uh, they often have a very, very skewed view of what things were like. Um, I would suggest that um, this gentleman I'm responding to uh, has a lot in common with Theodore Roosevelt and has a lot in common with uh, Blackstone um, and has a lot in common with uh, the conservative Americans who vilify Muslims and a lot in common with the fundamentalist Muslims who vilify Americans. I mean, like, he, he just, the narrative is so strong and I think it's so deep within us as human beings, um, so easy to swallow, so easy to believe that, I mean, I can't really fault him for buying it, um, but I hope that um, maybe his eyes can be opened and that's not, that's not uh, that I want him to, you know, hate women, but I would really like to him him to be able to see where I'm coming from and where those of us in this movement who deal with these issues are, are actually coming from. So, um, I'm going to go because it's just after two and I have to get this video up and I uh, have to do a whole bunch of other stuff to prepare to get up at 4 a.m. and go to the airport tomorrow. Um, just to let you all know, this is the shirt that I will be wearing, customized to AirPlay at the event, and uh, it will go. I, I don't think there is a single highest bidder in the fundraiser, so we might have to figure out a way to decide who gets it. And I will try and have it signed by all the appropriate people, Milo and Alum and Ash and Kathy and Christina and and as many other people um, as I can find there who who would be willing to sign it. So um, there you go. Anyhow, that's it for me until next week, where I will hopefully have the next installment of the Gregory Allen Elliott saga. And I will see you guys all in Florida. <laughs>